and welcome. Some people look back at the 1960s with a feeling of nostalgia, and those were indeed the years of the Beatles and of flower power. They were also a time of destruction on a massive scale, when a huge amount of railway lines were closed and the land sold and built over. If you've wondered why towns today the size of Fraserborough and Peterhead or Peebles and St Andrews don't have railway stations, the 1960s is the reason and the notorious Beeching Report. The story of what happened and the scale of the mistakes made is highlighted in a new book called Scotland's Lost Branch Lines, Where Beeching Got It Wrong. The author is David Spaven, who has spent his working life in and around the rail industry and has written a number of highly regarded books. Several of them have won awards and he's with us this evening. David, hello and welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Howie. Um, I was going to say that I'm very pleased to be here, but of course I'm in Edinburgh and not Orkney. Um, I've only been to Orkney once in my life back in the early 1980s, and uh, I really must put that right before long. But, but anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to give this talk, which is based on my 10th book, which was published this March. And you see the front, the front cover of it here, Scotland's Lost Branch Lines, with the subtitle, Where Beeching Got It Wrong?, and I was very insistent with the publisher that we get that subtitle in because I didn't just want a nostalgia fest. I wanted some proper analysis of where Beeching got things wrong. The, the cover you see there is actually the grand station at Comrie in Perthshire, sorry, per, uh, Creef in Perthshire with a train, the last train from Comrie to Glen Eagles. A very grand station and you might think that would have survived, but sadly it didn't. But we'll, we'll come back to that just a, a little bit later on. Now, really my talk is all about this man, uh, a hate figure in the 1960s, Dr. Richard Beeching, who was the chairman of the British Railways Board. And there you see him clasping his infamous report called the reshaping of British Railways, which led to closures, the length and breadth of the country. And here you see the most infamous of all the maps, the 13 maps in his report, map nine, which shows the pro proposed withdrawal of passenger train services. And if you look at all the black lines appropriately, they were all the lines in Scotland that Beeching wanted to ax. And I think probably you will have worked out that he did manage to get most of them axed in his quest to turn BR into a profitable organization. But getting a bit ahead of myself historically, um, I should really just give you a quick rundown of what I'm going to speak about over the next half hour or so. Firstly, I want to give you a, a broad overview about Scotland's branch lines as a whole. Uh, then I'm going to look at 10 of the closures that took place in the 1960s. Most of them as a result of beaching, but not all. Then what lessons can we learn? I, I, that was one of the main reasons that I researched and wrote the book. I wanted to, to find out the lessons from the time and how many of them might still be relevant today. And finally, uh, looking ahead to the future, what prospect is there of a renaissance of branch lines in Scotland? So there we are, the, a broader overview of the birth, life and death of Scotland's branch lines. Well. One of the first things I did when I started the book was to say, well, what exactly do we mean by a branch line? And I did quite a lot of uh, research into this, and I came up with uh, this definition, which is a secondary railway line running from a main line to a terminus. But I would add reference to distance, typically less than 20 miles in length. And such a definition distinguish it, distinguishes it from what's called a cross-country line, which can be defined as a secondary railway linking two main lines. And cross-country lines were usually longer than branch lines as well. Right, early route development. Well, here's a map of the situation in 1830. Um, the transport rev revolution based on the railway began in the late 1820s and early 1830s. 
And here you see in solid lines, the lines that were open in 1830, very few as you can see, the Kilmarnock and Troon Railway um, on the, the Clyde Coast there, and the Glasgow and Garnkirk Railway. The dotted lines were lines which would come into being over the next decade during the 1830s. And it's quite interesting just to see, for example, how there were isolated railway developments up in Tayside before the network was connected to everywhere else. And these railways were basically built to carry coal and in due course passengers as well. Now, if we jump forward to 1850 and things had really changed quite a lot, um, there had been expansion, the Anglo-Scottish lines uh, leading across the border. Let's just see if I can um, see if I can get the laser pointer. Who's having to just bear with me? Yes, here we are. Um, it, so we've got the East Coast Main Line running down here through Berwick to Newcastle, the West Coast Main Line from Glasgow and Edinburgh through Carstairs and Beatick Summit to Carlisle, and the Glasgow and South Western Railway through Cum Dumfries and Kilmarnock. And the railway had also expanded north to Aberdeen, got to Aberdeen in 1850. There were also railways to Hoyk from Edinburgh uh, and through Fife. But as you can see, nothing yet had been built in Galloway or the Highlands. That was all to come. Right. Excuse me if I'm not that brilliant on the technology. I'm a bit of a Luddite, but I think we're getting there. The zenith of railway development came in the early part of the 20th century, and here's a shot of the situation in 1900. Interestingly, the first motor car to arrive in Scotland um, reached Leith Docks in 1896, and car ownership, once the requirement to have a man with a red flag at the front was removed, really grew in leaps and bounds. But despite that, the rail network kept expanding um, really to places that it shouldn't have gone to in many cases. Um, and sowed the seeds of financial trouble in, in due course. The network in this country didn't have the guiding hand of government behind it, unlike the situation in continental Europe, where things were really a lot better planned than the kind of free for all here. The last line in Scotland to open was in 1909 uh, from Newborough to St. Fort in North Fife. And other late openings were the likes of, and let's see if I can get this a bit more quickly this time, uh, the likes of the Fort Augustus branch. Um, where else have we got? We had lines opening from Comrie to Balquidder. So quite a lot of lines opening up late, but frankly, most of these uh, should really never have been built. Sorry, bear with me. Okay, and we're jumping forward to 1937 now, and even by then there had been closures as a result of uh, competition from the roads. Uh, drivers and lorries came back from World War I, then the general strike in 1926 had a big impact on the railway. So we see a number of routes had disappeared already by that time, including uh, the branch line to Edsel up in Angus, uh, the Fort Augustus line had closed by then, as indeed had the branch line to Lauder in the borders. And where else have we got? Old Meldrum up in the northeast there. The situation that I described with sort of unfettered competition really did sort of undermine the situation very quickly once the car, the bus and the lorry came through. And these difficult finances are illustrated by a rather amusing story about the railway at Killin. Now, this is Killin not long before the railway closed in 1965. I'm not actually suggesting the railway should never have gone to Killin, but there's a rather nice story from a classic book called The Country Railway by David St. John Thomas, where he talks about the situation uh, with the Killin Railway. And he says, in due course, the 1921 Railways Act provided for the grouping of all Britain's railways into four companies, the largest of these being the LMS incorporating the Highland, Caledonian and Glasgow and Southwestern within Scotland. 
at the time, in terms of paid up capital, the LMS was the largest com railway company in the world. David St. John Thomas relates a delightful story from the opposite end of the spectrum. While Victoria was still on the throne, most locally created lines sold out for between 40 and 60% of their cost, and few were left to be amalgamated when all regular railways were compulsorily grouped into the Big Four in 1923. One such survival was Killin's Little Village Line, its sole purpose being to connect the Lockside settlement with the Oban branch. It refused point blank the first offer of one pound of LMS stock for each 100 pound of its own. The secretary at first did not understand how the newly formed LMS came into the picture anyway, though he went on to negotiate and eventually obtained eight pounds per hundred pounds. When sending a copy of the accounts in handwriting, he apologized. I am without a typist, but the Killin line never afforded anything as expensive as a typewriter. So there you have it, a rather interesting illustration of the problems of finance a long, long time ago, long before beaching. Subsequently, and obviously I'm compressing the history a lot here, two world wars very much exhausted the railway system, but it did bring, in the case of the Second World War, two new branch lines. And here is a map showing the branch line to Faz Lane. And the port Faz Lane, of course, was constructed in case Glasgow docks suffered from severe bombing during the war. Um, Faz Lane was used, and indeed there was another branch line built to uh, Cairn Ryan, which was intended to replace Liverpool docks if that got obliterated. And here's a photograph from the 1940s of the signal box at the junction uh, for the branch to Faz Lane with a vessel in the background on the gear lock. And interestingly, this branch line, unlike most, was double track. And trains ran on the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side, this being to give drivers experience of once they got on the continent and driving on French railways, for example, where they would be uh, traveling on the right. And then after all that, um, the railway was nationalized in 1948 to become British Railways. And one of the things that surprised me in my research was to find that the peak year for closures in Scotland wasn't during the beaching era, 1963, 64, 65, 66, but way back in 1951. I'm going to put up on the screen a list of all the lines that closed in Scotland in 1951. I'm not going to read them all out, but you can see for yourself it's a, it's a pretty sad story. Here's Comrie Station. And unlike many of the stations which closed in 1951, it lost all the services through to Balquidder passenger and freight when the passenger railway came off. Most, in most cases, freight services survived largely to carry domestic coal, which of course then was, was a very big deal in the UK. So then we go through a whole variety of branch lines across the country. We come to Pennycook, and Pennycook was more typical, uh, a very short branch line serving the local paper mills, and its freight services managed to continue right through until 1967. And there we are. 18 lines closed in 1951, more than in any year uh, of the beaching era. Now, after these closures, really the way that British Rail approached, British Railways as it was approached the, the network was, it blew hot and cold, closed quite a lot of lines, but then from 1955 to 1960, decided to try and upgrade some of the branch lines. And here you see a picture of Pomathorne Station and the Peebles branch line and what's called a diesel multiple unit. These were first introduced in, in Britain in the mid 1950s with the engine slung underneath the, the carriages rather than requiring a locomotive. And they were much cheaper to operate. They cut operating costs by typically two thirds. And in many cases in the early years, they boosted revenue by a third. So a, a very sensible measure by BR, but albeit it came in rather late. Something else which they did, which really didn't transform anything was the construction of low cost halts. Most of them at places uh, 
that had a very low population and really didn't have much future in terms of rail services. But this is one that was an exception to that. This is D Street Halt in Bankery, which was actually closer to the centre of Bankery than Bankery's original station. But you did need something of a head for heights to climb up to get the train there at the very rudimentary platform, which did not even have a bus shelter. So these upgradings took, took place, but it was all too late in the era of you've never had it so good. The, the, the well-known expression from Prime Minister Har Harold Macmillan talking about the success of the consumer society in the 50s and early 60s, although he never actually said you've never had it so good, what he said, our people have never had it so good. Anyway, that was the context and the railway was still lingering on in many rural areas. And here's, here's a picture of the terminus, a classic rural terminus at Edsel in Angus. What you see here actually is a, a passenger excursion train in 1962. The normal passenger service had disappeared way back in 1931. Freight dis didn't disappear until 1964, really long after it was justified. And if you look here from the left, you can see a siding for coal wagons. You can see two sidings for a loading bay, and you can see the goods shed where small consignments were handled. So a lot of infrastructure, a lot of staff to deal with it. And really, the fact that it lingered on did not help BR's finances. BR last made a profit in 1954, and the losses mounted fast thereafter. So the government panicked, um, and Dr. Beeching was brought in. But interestingly, BR's losses in 1959 in real terms were just two thirds of the cost that the taxpayer was paying for the privatized rail network just before the lockdown. So everything's relative in this. Now here's Beeching's diagnosis, and this is a map of the, the density of passenger traffic on the network in, in Scotland. And I won't go into the detail, but you can see that the, the dotted lines which carried the least traffic really covered an awful lot of Scotland and densely used lines were concentrated largely in the central belt. No great surprise, perhaps. A similar analysis of the road system would have shown up something a bit like that. So that was the density. What about the passenger stations? This is a map showing the revenue at passenger stations. The highest revenue was at the places that are marked with a green dot, um, the lowest with the red dots and the intermediate level with blue dots. And you can immediately see that an awful lot of stations in Scotland were in the lowest revenue category. Many of them really should not have survived until the beaching era. Um, in some ways, they, they hindered the, the rail network operationally because trains had to stop at too many places between the more uh, important locations. And so having had the doctor's diagnosis, we then got the prescription. Um, back to that map I showed you earlier. And you can see that it was a pretty grim prognosis for Scotland. And uh, what actually happened was that there were around 40 lines threatened. Only nine of them were reprieved. Uh, most importantly, most significantly, the lines north and west of Inverness to Kyle of Lacalche and to Thurzo and Wick, uh, the line from Ayr to Stranraer and the line from Glasgow to Edinburgh via Shots through declining uh, coal, mine, coal mine communities. And some big losses included not just branch lines, but the Waverley route from Edinburgh through Galashiels and Hoyk to Carlisle, the Dumfries Stranraer line, and the line from Perth to Aberdeen through Forfar, the Strathmore line. So a, a, a pretty drastic situation. And to come on to what that meant in terms of individual branch lines. I've selected 10 for the book. I traveled in all these routes in my childhood, but that's not the only reason I chose them. I also felt that in most cases, these lines actually should not have closed in the 1960s. And I like to think that luckily, the research that I did for the book has vindicated uh, my youthful connection, conviction about these closures. The first, route is the line through Peebles. This was a pre-beach enclosure, 1962. And 
the, the Peebles line opened in 1855 from Edinburgh to Peebles and then through to Gala Shields in 1866. And you, I think you'll be able to see that it runs off the main line. The main line ran from Edinburgh through Esquire to, to Galish. That's the Waverley route. And the, the Peebles line, rather than a branch line, was really a loop line. And it was expensive to operate. There were no fewer than 16 manual level crossings on the Peebles line. And automatic level crossings had been pioneered a long time before on the continent. And even in Britain, about six months before the Peebles line closed. So there were opportunities to economize, which were not taken. Diesel multiple units, as you see here, were introduced from 1958, but it was a relatively slow and irregular service. And here you see it on the very last day. And the two laddies you see there, that's my wee brother on the right, and that's me on the left. Um, our father took us down for a last hurl on the train. So sadly, that was the end of the Peebles line. Creef and Comrie is an interesting one because as I titled the chapter in, in my book, um, the problem here was the wrong kind of train, not the wrong kind of leaves or the wrong kind of snow, but the wrong kind of train. Uh, the branch line ran from Glen Eagles to Creef opening in 1856, and then was opened westwards the further six miles on to Comrie in 1893. Now, the diesel multiple units that I mentioned earlier were introduced at a very early stage. This is Creef Station in 1956. I've lost my dates here, but this was one of the first DMUs to be introduced in Scotland. And they were popular because you had a view out the front window. They were cleaner than the old steam engines and they were faster. But sadly for Creef and Comrie, what BR introduced into regular service when that started in 58 was something called a rail bus. And the rail buses really were a bit of a disaster. They were unreliable. They didn't carry many more people than a, a bus on the road. And they'd all been withdrawn by the late 1960s. And they certainly failed to save the line to Creef and Comrie. Again, quite a lot of manual level crossings that could have been automated. And my strong feeling when I first started researching this book was that a simple long siding from Glen Eagles to Creef using diesel multiple units could have enabled the railway to cut its losses and provide a, a very valuable ongoing service to the community. But the line closed in 1964. How we mentioned earlier about Fraser and Peter Head, and uh, they're, they're two, two contrasting cases, and I talk about the wrong kind of locomotive as well. Uh, he, here's, the, here's the map. Um, 1862, the railway got to Peter Head, and then a branch from the junction that Maud carried on up to Fraserburgh, opening in 1865. And it was a railway that performed a very valuable function, both for passengers and freight. And of course, a lot of fish traffic from Peterhead and Fraserburgh went by rail almost until the very end of freight services in 1979. But one of the problems with what happened on the Fraserburgh line was the wrong kind of locomotive. And this is what's called a North British Locomotive Company Type 2. This was one of the least reliable diesels introduced um, from the late 50s, using the Buchan lines rather than using DMUs, which meant the operating costs were significantly higher than they should have been. And sometimes, sometimes these 1,100 horsepower locomotives were hauling really a, a negligible load, just two carriages behind this Peterhead train at Maud. So the economics were far from good, particularly in, in the case of Peterhead, because it was a roundabout route by rail there. The road ran more directly through Ellen and up the coast through Cruden Bay and Bodham. Uh, so Peterhead was struggling really from the very start. It was an expensive operation. The line to Fraserburgh had far too many crossing loops, too much staff, and as I say, the wrong kind of locomotive. And the line closed in, in 1965, although freight services continued to Fraserburgh until 1979. We now come a bit further south to Fife, and this is an interesting example of 
what was a cross country line that eventually got cut back to two short branch lines, which in turn succumbed. And it's a good illustration of the, the, the maxim that if you cut the trunk, the branches will wither. The, the line from Thornton Junction through Leaven and East Newt Towns to St Andrews and Lucas Junction opened in various stages between 1852 and 1887 and was very popular with day trippers and people going for what was then a full summer holiday a week or two weeks in East Newt Towns before, of course, the switch to taking holidays by plane in Spain. Uh, came to undermine that, that kind of holiday making in Fife. Now, BR did, did introduce DMUs for most services uh, along the line. And here you see a shot in the summer of 1964. And actually my mother and myself and my brother in the foreground, they're waiting to board a train back to Edinburgh. So BR did some good things, but there were far too many crossing loops, too much staff. Um, and yet despite that, the revenue on the routes covered just over half its costs, which was very good compared to a lot of these branch lines. And it just makes you think what could have been done to further economize and save the railway for future generations. But it closed in 1965, leaving the short stubs from Thornton to Leaven and Lucas to St Andrews. There's a train to St Andrews was passing two golfers on the very last day of service in 1969. The St Andrews branch was grievously harmed by the opening of the Tay Road Bridge, which undermined the convenience of the railway. And uh, in the end, it's hard not to see both sides of the argument because a lot of the passenger traffic was lost when the road bridge opened. But nevertheless, if the through line had remained, I think it would have been a highly popular scenic route these days. And here's Leaven. Leaven struggled on for a few months, but it also closed in, in 1969. And that left people with a, a not terribly attractive um, alternative by road. And I just want to quote again from the book about the consequences of all that. And here I say, the public notices announcing the closure decision for Leaven made reference to the replacement bus services, including special mention of the bus train connection which had been arranged from Crail to Edinburgh via Leaven and Kirkcaldy. This would depart Crail at 6.17 a.m. and with a change of buses at Leaven and a change from bus to train, not immediately adjacent at Kirkcaldy, would reach Edinburgh Waverley at 8.55 a.m. The intrepid public transport user from Crail now faced a journey of two hours, 38 minutes with two changes compared to the through rail journey of one hour, 56 minutes on the 6.49 a.m. train from Crail to Edinburgh in 1965. Such was the price of progress. Now we come on to uh, calendar. And I've described this as the baby in the bathwater in the book, and um, I'll explain why in a minute. The railway from Dunblane to Calendar opened in 1858. And it wasn't until 1880 that the line beyond Calendar all the way through to Oban uh, opened for passenger and freight traffic. This was a railway that was very busy, particularly in the summer, and important for both freight and passenger traffic. But the rot really set in in the 1950s with the rise of the bus, the car and the lorry. Uh, so in winter in particular, um, things didn't look great at Calendar. And BR, in its wisdom, did not introduce diesel multiple units. So trains were operated by local hauled services. And here you see an express steam engine with just two, two carriages at Calendar. That was a very expensive option, which undermined the case for the railway. There were diesel multiple unit services at Calendar, but they were only used for special excursion trains, uh, which ran at summer weekends. And these trains were very imaginative. They ran from places that didn't normally have through services, right the way through Calendar, um, up past uh, Loch Lugneg, um, and I'm running out of my lochs here. They went to Killin, so it was Loch Tay as well. They were called the Six Lochs Excursion. And a wonderful day out, but sadly and terribly, the revenue from these charter trains was not credited to the railway to calendar. It all went into central funds. 
So the figures that were presented at the time of closure uh, really suggested that the line was in a worse state than it really was. And here's Calendar Station, three years after closure, beautiful station, one of the scenic highlights of the journey, but falling into rack and ruin. And interestingly, when, when closure came about, a government uh, advisory body had recommended that the railway be protected between Callander and Dunblane because of the prospect of future commuter traffic. Now, that never happened. The line wasn't protected, and so lots of it was lost for housing, new roads, etc. A typical British lack of foresight, which penalised future generations. And yet that short line from Canada to Dunblane, with a bit of sensible rationalization, including something like 80% of the, the operating ground staff like signalmen and station staff, could have been taken out of the equation to produce a much more cost-effective, what was called basic railway. Ballantar is the second last of the lines I'm going to look at. The railway here opened in 1866 through Bankery, and a Boyne through to Ballater, just a wee bit short of Balmoral Castle, uh, because Queen Victoria didn't want the railway running past Balmoral. The railway uh, was supposedly at Ballater, visited by more heads of state than any other railway station in Europe. But by the time you get to the late 50s, things were not looking so great. Um, BR did introduce new rolling stock. This was a, an experimental battery rail car, which ran from Aberdeen to Ballater from 1958 until the early 60s. Unfortunately, it proved not to be terribly reliable. And the rail service provided was not what it could have been. And again, there were far too many crossing loops, too many staff. And despite a consultant's report suggesting it could be operated more economically, the closure went ahead. And yet here we are, classic tourist line that could have been doing so well now, not just in terms of Scott Rail services, but charter trains. The luxury Royal Scotsman would have, I'm sure, been a visitor here. But it didn't happen, and the railway closed in 1966. Ballahoolish, a bit different. It was always a branch line. I mean, really, it should have gone on all the way to Fort William at the very north of the map here uh, as a through route uh, from Oban and the south to Fort William. But that didn't happen. So when the 1960s came along, it was very exposed, only serving villages, not a strategic route. And here's a photograph taken two weeks after closure. And in the far distance, you can see Loch, e Loch Leven, which really should have been bridged to take the railway right the way through to Fort William. And in fact, at Fort William, at its original station, the railway did run a couple of hundred yards further south with Loch Linney on the right, but it never got any further than that. And if you have a look at this map here, you can see what might have been done um, here's the railway from the West Highland Line from Glasgow to Cree and Larich and along to Oban. Here's the Balahoolish branch. Here's the West Highland Line carrying on across Rannoch Moor to Fort William. And what was suggested in the 1960s, the early 60s, by an, the, the Highlands and Islands Advisory Panel was that the railway should be extended from Balahoolish Ferry up to Fort William, with the result you could close the exposed and isolated railway over Rannoch Moor and create really one of the most wonderfully scenic routes to the to Fort William, a Loch Loch Linney would have been one of the most scenic routes in Britain. But sadly, it wasn't to happen and the line closed in 1966. So what lessons can we learn? Well, don't get too worried by the, uh, the, the, the figures here. I'd just like you to look at the three coloured columns where I list all the economising measures that were possible. Uh, firstly, was the infrastructure in the branch significantly rationalised? Was the service converted to DMU operation? Were most of the stations de-staffed? And if you look down there, you can see that in some cases, none of these economising measures was put in place, most notably in the case of Calendar. But you can see that virtually everywhere, BR did not do everything they might have done to secure an economic future for these branch lines.
What should have been done? Here's North Berwick in its heyday, the five mile branch from Drem to North Berwick with a double track passenger station, extensive goods yard, a goods shed for handling parcels, etc. This line unusually was reprieved in 1969. And what then happened was that the, the tracks were stripped right back to a single track, which was the sensible thing to do. Um, here you see a close up of the station, diesel multiple unit operation. Sadly, in their enthusiasm to economize, BR stripped away all the lovely old Victorian buildings, which could have performed a, a wider community function. However, nowadays, here we are, we've got a, an electrified branch line to North Berwick with an hourly service to Edinburgh, which can only make you think, hmm, what if something like that had been done on other branch lines? So my key conclusions, British Railways ignored the scope for infrastructure rationalization, have we seen? The opportunities to develop the services were rejected. And this is something that comes out very interestingly in terms of my research, that the statistics that justify closure were often very, very dubious. And there were too many half-hearted campaigns against closure. In some cases, the trade unions and local campaigners got together and really fought a good campaign in other cases, it was quite half-hearted. And it has to be said that the trained unions really didn't pull their weight. As a result of all that, I think we can fairly say that Scotland needlessly lost a significant number of rail routes. Is there going to be a branch line renaissance ahead? Well, I like to think so. Um, my book wasn't just about the past. It does pose the question of how many of these routes could reopen. And we now have the climate emergency, we've got road congestion, we have air pollution and rail is a solution. And the branch line to Leavenmouth, fortunately, is going to reopen in 2023. Here you see work in recent months and lifting the old track and laying in the new track. And there's the location of Leavenmouth station, which will put, put a community that's more populous than anywhere else in Scotland back on the rail network at long last. So closures can be reversed. Where should happen next? Well, there we are, Fraserburgh and Peterhead, further from the rail network than any other towns of their size in Britain. And St Andrews is the third largest town in Scotland without a rail service. And there's also passenger opportunities. What about rural rail freight? And there's a very interesting case study in terms of whiskey and bulk spirit. And here's a Here's an, an amazing statistic. 1.5 million tonnes of bulk spirit moves from the north of Scotland to central belt maturation and blending plants every year. And since 1992, 100% has gone by road haulage. 50,000 long distance whisky vehicle trips along the A9. And how frequently we see, we see the results of that with serious injuries and fatalities on the road. But there is a rail freight solution available. This is a map of the rail network that I produced in a, a presentation for the big whiskey company Diageo a number of years ago. And you can see marked in D, the big sites at Leavenmouth is the large, at Cameron Bridge on the Leavenmouth branch is the largest grain distillery in Europe with a major bottling plant beside it. There are also at, uh, now let's just see if I can get this up on the laser. Just here at Canvas Black Grange near Alloa is the largest bonded warehousing site in the whole of Europe. And they're all right beside the railway. So there's an opportunity here. And this was demonstrated back nine years ago <clears throat> when a trial train ran from Elgin, as you see here, carrying um, bulk, uh, bulk containers of, of whiskey to the central belt via Grangemouth. And that worked well in physical terms, but it's an expensive business laying on a train. It will cost you between five and 10,000 pound a day. And no one company is going to take that on board and take all the risk. The rail companies can't take the risk because they make very small margins on the rail freight business. So what's needed really is pump priming by the Scottish government, but they haven't shown any willingness to do that yet. But the idea of putting in a temporary subsidy, say for a year, to get a train service going from Elgin and Keith down to the central belt um, has to have lots of benefits, economic benefits, wider environmental benefits, taking traffic off the roads. 
So the government has a big, a big place in all this, but so far it hasn't been willing. So there we are. Uh, I'm concluding by talking about the future. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've slightly overrun my time. I hope this talk has whetted your appetite for, for the book. Um, I'll certainly be pleased to hear any comments and try and field any questions. Um, and finally, I couldn't resist a wee bit of the hard sell by just excerpts from a few of the reviews of the book, which so far have all been positive. So thank you very much. And I will now try and operate the technology. I'm feeling brain dead at the moment, but let's see if I can just do this. Bear with me. That's it. Well done, David. That's totally fascinating. <laughs> Questions have been coming in while you've been speaking. And in fact, let's just um, pick up that last one about freight. You were giving the example of 1.5 million um, tons of bulk spirit being shifted a, a, a year. And um, one comment is it, it's indeed saying surely taking freight off the roads ought to be a priority. Yes, and I, I mean, the irony is that it actually, in, in theory, has been a priority of the UK government since the 19, mid-70s and from the Scottish, for the Scottish government for a long time as well. And there is a grant system available that allows the Scottish government to grant up to 75% of the cost of putting in sidings, putting in a crane, other equipment to do with shifting from road to rail. But it, it can be quite difficult to meet the criteria involved. And really more needs to be done, I think, in particular, in terms of the pump priming that I mentioned earlier to enable these new train services, as opposed to the kit uh, and the equipment to be facilitated. Um, I, I think the worry now is we're facing such a cutback in public expenditure uh, in the coming years that, you know, hard choices are going to have to be made. My view is that the Scottish government, while it's paid lip service to rail freight, its big agenda is still building roads. And I can't see how that has got any connection with the idea of, uh, of, of cutting our, our carbon emissions. So there's a contradiction in there, and it's all very political, of course, but the railway could be making a much better contribution. It really could. And there's another question come in. Somebody who noticed those early maps you started with showing, for instance, how many rail lines came into existence in just 20 years from 1830 to 1815. And in contrast, things seem to be so slow nowadays, even to just reopen one station seems to take many years and much consultation. And I wondered, what's the reason for this contrast between the speed of the Victorians in creating all these rail lines and our apparent inability to do so much about it today? That's a, a very good point. And I haven't really thought about it in those terms before, but absolutely right. I mean, of course, what happened between 1830 and 1850 was it was all private sector led at a time when there were no modern roads, shipping was quite slow. So as I say in the book, communities of significance and communities of no significance whatsoever were all clamoring to get on the railway. And so landowners were keen to do it. The railway companies were keen. The public wanted to see it. We're now in a much different situation, obviously, with the rise of road competition. And there's also the complication that the process is, uh, as your questioner suggested, the, the consultation involved, the, the, the difficulty of creating what's called a business case um, really makes it very hard to get railways reopened. But having said that, since the 1980s, we've had Edinburgh to Bathgate reopening and then from Bathgate right through to Airdrie. We've had the line to Alloa reopen. We've had the line to Lark Hall. And most significant of all, we've had the 30 plus miles of the, the Borders Railway reopening part of the old Waverley route. And, you know, in the end, the Borders Railway, I was heavily involved in the campaign myself. And, you know, the business case, the way it was worked out by consultants, never really stacked up. Their forecasts of traffic were unbelievably pessimistic. Um, but the political pressure was there from the grassroots and from politicians. 
and it was a, a it was good project for the Scottish Parliament to grab hold of and demonstrate the Parliament could make a difference. And of course, when the railway eventually reopened, the forecasts of patronage, the official forecasts, were proved to be woefully pessimistic. And that's affected the prospects elsewhere. That you know the consultants come up with these cons conservative forecasts. And so the government can turn around and say, well, it's not worth doing because there's no business case. But, you know, one of these years, the Scottish government's going to wake up to the fact that their forecasting techniques have been rubbish and they need to look at it in a different way and look at all the wider benefits, social, economic and environmental. And indeed, with that borders railway line, is it the case that there was a lot of economic benefits, you know, people being able to commute more easily, businesses being able to set up? So in addition to the numbers of passengers, there was this wider impact? Yes, very much so, Howie. And, you know, one of the reasons that Scottish Borders Council backed the idea of calling it the Borders Railway, which actually we campaigners came up with first, was it helps to put the borders on the map. Literally, it's the Borders Railway, that's where you're going. And that's already enabled them to attract a new investment at Gala Shields and Tweed Bank and beyond. Um, the Tapestry of Scotland is now in Gala Shields. There are a variety of developments taking place around Tweed Bank. Uh, people can now take day trips and go to Abbots, Sir Walter Scott's Abbotsford through integrated bus and rail services. You've got the advantage for people who want to do further education previously would have had to leave the borders to access further education, but now they can catch the train up to, um, there's um, the college uh, near S Bank Station, also near Brunston Station and coming right into Edinburgh. So access to education has been important as well. And obviously the ability to commute into Edinburgh for jobs in central Edinburgh without depending on the, the rather slower bus and the car, both of which are affected by congestion. So yes, lots of wider benefits and benefits that were not really properly captured by this quote unquote business case. And just going back now to the, the time of the closures, you mentioned uh, the, the unions and the, the extent to which they were able to campaign or, or not able to campaign so well. One viewer asks, to what extent were lines closed rather than made more efficient by staff reductions to avoid disputes between BR and the rail unions? Yes, that, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, what happened at the time was that Dr. Beeching bent over backwards to discourage union objections by ensuring there were very generous redundancy terms for all the people who would be swept away by the closures. And the NUR, the National Union of Railwomen itself, its, its General Secretary, Sidney Green, he was of the view that he was more interested in protecting existing conditions elsewhere and that if a downsizing was negotiated on branch lines then that might have repercussions for the big concentrations of union membership in the big cities, the conurbations etc. And his view was he wanted to see a situation where re remaining railway staff became eventually an elite rather than being poorly paid and reliant on overtime. And ultimately, I think his vision came true because we've now got a situation where, for example, ScotRail train drivers are on a basic of £52,000 a year, which is double the average wage or salary in Scotland. And uh, I think there's some interesting questions about how long we'll be able to sustain that sort of situation. But uh, certainly, yeah, um, the uh, closures were seen as being easier than all the negotiation that might have been involved in downsizing. And a question about the, the choice of Dr. Beeching. Now, this is, I guess, speculation, but at the time, I can just remember the, the hype about it, that this was a businessman going to make, and the, I think the phrase was used, or the implication was there, make the railways pay. But instead of acting like a businessman, uh, or at least like an entrepreneur and regarding the railways as a resource and coming in with ideas about marketing or technology. He really did what anyone in the, the civil service could have simply said, close them. So <laughs> do you think to that extent he was 
the wrong man for the job, but yet he might even have been deliberately chosen just because of it. <laughs> that, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, he was brought in to make the railways pay. I mean, that turned out to be a forlorn hope. I mean, there's basically no railway system in the world that pays because supporting the infrastructure, the, the dedicated uh, track and all the rest of it, with all the benefits environmentally and economically that brings, it, it doesn't tend to turn in a conventional profit. Now, Beechin came from ICI. The older of us will remember the name ICI, the, the chemicals company, and he was a hard-nosed businessman. And, you know, in many ways, he's had a, an unfair press because a lot of what he did was very good. The closures dominated the, the, the media, as you would expect. But he did things like pioneering intercity rail travel. And that was really a world pioneer. And the concept and the branding was admired by railway systems all over the world. He introduced innovations on the freight side, uh, high speed container trains between main centres, merry-go-round coal trains that ran from collieries to power stations. So he did a lot of good things, but the closures dominated the public agenda. And I'm 99% convinced that Beeching was basically told you've got to go down this closures route. Don't look at economizing, it'll take too long. We're not sure what the side effects of it will be. Don't go down that route of saying, yes, we could run this line more economically. And if you read his report, as I've done on a number of occasions, he makes absolutely no mention about the scope for economizing, you know, reducing double track to single track, cutting out crossing loops, destaffing stations, absolutely no mention of it whatsoever. So I thought early on in my research, this was Beeching's blind spot, but I think it was Beeching's blind eye. To, to what extent was the growth of the roads, the growing power of the roads industry, the people who built, built roads, built motor cars, to what extent was the roads industry a really key factor? Yeah, I think very much a key factor. I mean, Ernest Marples, who was the Minister of Transport at the time of Beeching, I mean, he'd previously been the managing director of a road construction company. He passed the shares on to his wife when he became Minister of Transport, but I don't think that fooled anybody. So he was gung-ho for a, a road building solution. Um, quite, quite a lot of, you know, even Social Democrat Labour politicians were of the view that the roads were the way forward, that to preserve the railways was, you know, benefiting those who were already better off rather than people at the bottom end of the scale. The, trade, the road trade unions like the Transport and General Workers Union were very much keen to see the demise of branch lines, bringing more business to their members on the, on the buses and in road haulage services as well. So yeah, the roads lobby has been massively important, I would say, since at least the 1950s. In fact, it, it goes back before that. Um, the roads lobby always had it out for the railway. And um, while in a way the situation's the same now, one of the ironies is that if you look at rail freight, some of the biggest users of rail freight now are actually road haulage and logistics companies because they realize that for long hauls, 200, 300 miles, it's much better to put the container on the train and just leave the lorry for the local collection and delivery. And indeed, there's a comment about that, and it's about Tesco using rail freight as far north as Inverness. But the viewer says it's lorries up the A9 to Caithness and Orkney from there. Is that something that there is a, a solution to get that to, for that welcome change of getting those big lorries off some of the winding parts of the A9? I would certainly like to think so. Now, the Far North Line, which, which, which I've, I've, I've written the history of it, and uh, indeed I started my railway career on the Far North Line. And there was a time back in the 1990s when the, what well, was Safeway at that time, were sending their containers all the way north to uh, Caithness. But latterly, you had a 3,000 horsepower locomotive pulling two or three containers, and the economics of that just does not stack up. And so I come back to the role of Scottish government. The rail freight companies can't take a risk like that. No one customer can take a risk like that. So what about pump priming a service from Inverness to Caithness so you can get two or three or four or five different users coming in 
And they don't all have to start at once. They watch other people using rail, get the confidence to use it. They start switching their traffic across. So it does need public sector intervention for what is otherwise a private sector initiative. And there's another question coming in about what should our hit list be for possible areas to reopen? And the questioner says, surely there must be a lot of demand for visitors to St Andrews, for instance. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, St Andrews is now the third largest town in Scotland without a rail service, albeit that there is a, a pretty good road rail interchange at Lukers, uh, five miles away on the Edinburgh Dundee main line. I mean, the interchange there is one of the best in Scotland, although one has to say that by continental European standards, the best in Scotland is not particularly great. Um, quite a lot of the route to St Andrews from Lukers has been lost to development. Um, one of the solutions there might be to introduce what's called tram trains. Uh, and they're a form of tram that can run on the main line, pioneered in Germany more than 20 years ago. And they can get round difficult curves. They can go up gradients that conventional trains can't serve. So a tram train from St Andrews, from the very heart of St Andrews, um, through Guard Bridge to Lukers, then on to the, to the main line, into Dundee, could come off the main line in Dundee and penetrate right to the heart of Dundee city centre, which is still rather cut off from the railway by all the roads that were built round the station when the Tay Road Bridge opened. So, yes, yeah, St Andrews is another strong case. And another question has come in on this point of new technology. We look at these huge locomotives in the days of steam, huge locomotives too in the, the, the case of diesel, and they're really pulling behind them, sometimes just a couple of carriages, not much more than a, than a bus, but with this huge amount of, of solid iron that's being moved. Is there any technology to make it possible for lighter units for passenger services more along the lines of, of a bus on rails? Well, really, you know, the, the, the diesel multiple unit, uh, I showed a few photos of the first generation of them, and we now have subsequent generations, which are called sprinters, um, were called sprinters originally, uh, lightweight, good acceleration. And of course, we're now moving on to a situation where, well, you know, if we're going to have zero carbon, what type of unit will we have? And there's quite a lot of innovation out there to do with battery um, and hydrogen. But, you know, for most routes, the, the answer should be overhead electrification. For most main routes and, the, you know, the commuter lines in the central belt, overhead electrification is the answer. But yes, we, we need more economic ways of accessing communities to rail. I mean, not everywhere is going to get a railway, but one of the things that I've advocated is that when it doesn't justify reopening a railway, we should make sure that the bus service is part of an integrated network, as you see on the continent, where we don't have this daft deregulated system here. So you can get bus and rail properly linking together in terms of the, the bus and railway station being together through ticketing, um, a seamless service, and that will attract people back. But the current system is not designed to attract people back to, to multimodal journeys, I'm afraid. David, this is fascinating. As you can see from the comments and questions coming in, there's been a great deal of interest. And uh, I've got a copy of your, your book here, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and there's one more comment. I'll just mention this final comment that's come in. In Thurso, it's you mentioned the need for an integrated transport system. It's impossible to get a bus from the ferry, the Hamnevo, to the station in time to catch a train. The, the questioner says the, the opposite of integration. So that really underlines what you say. Thank you warmly again. I hope there's an opportunity to meet again and indeed to, to welcome you to Orkney at some point in the future. Thank you, David. And before we go, I should just say we'll be back again next week and we're going to shift to... Um, the wilds, we're going to talk about areas of biology, about landscape, about living creatures. In the meantime, though, we've much enjoyed David's talk. Thank you and goodbye now. Thank you.